thank you very much, Ryan, for the introduction. And uh, I wanted to say again thank you to, for the organizers for letting me speak, especially that I have a minor confession to make. So uh, I'm not going to be talking about stuff that I actually know about. I'm going to be talking about uh, things that we got recently very excited about uh, and we've been working on for the past uh, six months. So where is my pointer? So the data sets that I will be presenting or the data sets on which we are drawing a lot of analyses uh, are derived partly from the time that I had my lab uh, back in Norway at the SAR Center. Uh, and then the current analysis will have been done at the Research School of Biology. And I wanted to start by acknowledging my co-authors, Marcin, who has been with me for a very long number of, very large number of years, but has been working this project for the past uh, 13 years, and Oli, who has joined the lab uh, approximately six months ago. Uh, Marcin is a bioinformatician, and Oli is mainly uh, lab-based. So I'm going to be talking to you about the vertical transmission of sponge microbiomes, but what I really like and what I've been working on for a, quite a long time so far uh, are the sponges. And the reason why I study sponges is because I'm an evolutionary biologist, so this is why I'm probably opening this session. The way I think about sponges is that they are a transition uh, between single cell, colonial, single cell and colonial protists, single cell organisms that are our relatives, and true animals such as cnidarians, including corals, jellyfish, and so on, and bilaterians, which is basically all other animals you can think about. Now, we know that sponges are a step between coanoflagellates, our nearest non-animal relatives, and other animals, because they have this very special cell type that is sitting inside, they are, it's forming their inner part of their body, and it's responsible for movement of the water and for capture of food particles. So, Probably many of you know that sponges are filter feeders, and they are filter feeders like our nearest relatives, and they are mainly eating bacteria, but also a lot of uh, phytoplankton and also a lot of dissolved organic matter. So that explains why I care, because as an evolutionary biologist, I am really interested in how transition from those single cell colonial organisms to those really complex, beautiful creatures like corals, uh, hexacorals uh, and octocorals, and scallops, and ascidians, and vertebrates like fish has occurred. But I am not here to tell you about why I care about it. I'm going to tell you why you should be caring about sponges. <laughs> So the reason why should be, you should be caring about sponges is they are the key element of the reef, even if you don't see them uh, all the time. So Johnny Wolf, uh, in a recent review, is listing eight main reasons of sponges being the key elements of the reef. She's talking about the fact that uh, they are fortifying the flame framework, they are uh, bioeroding, which means they are making some calcium carbonate accessible to other animals, they are consolidating loose rubble, gluing the corals, they are also harboring symbionts, more of it, about it in a moment, and they are maintaining water clarity and possibly also eating up pathogens that would otherwise be causing trouble, and they are serving as food for those really exciting animals such as angelfish and hawksbill turtles and nudibranchs, those bloody nudibranchs eat my sponges all the time, and then they are also, and again, in collaboration with microbial symbionts, they are influencing the seawater concentration of important things. So I would like you to have another look at those pictures. I was initially telling you, you should be looking at those corals here, and ascidians, and scallops, and fish. But if you really look carefully, you will see a sponge here, a sponge here, a sponge here, a sponge here, and a few tiny sponges here. Really, sponges are everywhere in the reef. And not only they are everywhere, but they have been recently proposed to actually be the answer to Darwin's paradox. So if you don't know what Darwin's paradox is, is Darwin has noticed that when you travel the ocean and then you see the coral reef, you realize that you are like if you were on the desert and then suddenly there is this blooming oasis with all this biodiversity and beauty and productivity. And Darwin wondered how on earth could it be possible? Well, he should have thought about sponges. So it turns out that if you, if you start looking not just at the surface of the reef, or not just even at the, at the rocks that you see under the corals, but if you start looking into the cryptic environments in all those little caves and caverns that are under the corals, uh, you will realize that sponges cover more than 50% of the surface more than 50%. That is two orders of magnitude more than any other filter feeders. Within five minutes of the water passing through the cavern, they are able to extract over 50% of algae and bacteria that is passing through that. I mean, I don't think there is anything as magnificent as sponges when it comes to uh, filter units. And then what, it, what they also said in this paper is that what it means is that anything that comes to the reef from the 
from the outside of the reef habitat is immediately captured by sponges. And when it's captured by sponges, it's then made into, it's nitrified, denitrified, there is a lot of cal uh, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and so on cycling, and this is transferring the nutrients to the reef. But this is not all. In fact, quite recently, people found that it's not only that the actual cells, like bacterial cells or algal cells, can be captured by sponges, but also that sponges are able to assimilate dissolved organic matter. So every kind of protein and any other stuff like that that floats above the reef or through the reef is effectively removed by the filter feeder sponges. And in fact, it has been measured that sponges are able to remove dissolved organic matter from the water column in 30 minutes, the amount that would take free living bacteria uh, approximately 30 days. So what is more is that once these elements are captured, they are then taken up by the colonocytes, those collar cells that are waving their flagella and so on, and sponges don't use this for growth. I mean, if they were using all of these things that they capture for growth, we would be overgrown by sponges and it would be beautiful but perhaps slightly scary. Instead, what they are doing is they are shedding colonocytes. So those colonocytes are highly proliferative and they are then shed into the water column and falling as the tritus. And then what you have is this fantastic food material for anything that is uh, detrivore. So then there are those cells that are full of, uh, full of nutrients and they can be eaten by snails and whatever else wants to eat them. And then from there they can be taken up, uh, the, up the uh, food network. All right, so I hope I have convinced you that sponges are very important. And from now on when you are diving or snorkeling or just thinking about the reef, you'll be thinking about sponges. But let's take a step, another step. So it turns out that sponges are not acting alone. And in fact, if you have been uh, reading popular literature recently, uh, you have probably noticed that we have noticed, all of us humans, that we are not alone. There is a lot of talking about the microbiomes, the, uh, the gut, uh, the, the fecal transplants, and so on, because we have realized that we are not really individuals anymore, or we have never been individuals, we just haven't known about it, but we are really made up of the organism that has started as the fertilized egg cell, and a huge amount of microbes that are with us. Now, there is a number of terms that people are using. One of them is holobiont, which is the organism and all its microbial components. The holobiont, of course, has the hologenome, and the hologenome is composed of the host genome and the microbiome genome. And this cannot and should not be confused with the environmental metagenome, which is all these microbes that are outside of you and why they would be sequenced if you grabbed a sample of, say, a sponge or a coral. They really are not part of the organism. It's a bit complicated, and it's also very confusing for an evolutionary biologist because we've been thinking a lot in terms of selection that the unit of the selection is, is an organism. Well, some of us said these are genes. But really, when you think about the uh, holobions and, and hologenomes and so on, you realize that the paradigm has shifted and we are now thinking about holobion as the unit of selection. And it's make it, making it a bit complicated for a lot of thoughts we have about evolution and selection. All right. So we know that microbes in all organisms, animals and plants, are involved in many processes, including nutrient cycling, they produce vitamins and so on. And we have also been finding that microbiomes, including coral microbiomes, are known or are suggested based on studies in model species to play key roles in disease, disease resistance and resilience. And this is why I think you should be caring even more. Because what we know about sponges is that they, their microbiomes are a very important component. So if you think about sponge microbiome in some sponges, they can take the microbes that are part of the holobiont can take up to 35% of the biomass. And if you think about the size of the sponge cell and the size of the bacteria, you would realize there is many more bacterial cells than sponge cells in those organisms. The sponge microbiomes are extremely diverse. They are transmitted horizontally from environment or vertically from mother. This is what I'm going to be telling you about in a moment. They are definitely involved in cycling of a lot of nutrients. And they are known as in humans, for example, to produce vitamins, but also to produce secondary metabolites, which the sponges are producing to protect themselves from those bastard nudibranchs that are trying to eat them. <laughs> All right. So I have 
started making this slide, and I wrote on it, scientists need their models, and the models that I am using is Amphinium queenslandica, which many of you know. It has been found on Heron Island originally, and then those two calcareous sponges. But then I have given it a bit of thought through the night last night, and I have realized that this is actually not true. There's a lot of scientists, including many of you here, who are never using models. You are going straight to the field, and you are evaluating what you see there. But lab rats like me uh, need our models, and I'm going to try to convince you at some point, either to either now during the talk or later on, is that what we really need to be doing in the center and as we are doing any kind of biology is that we need to be going in iterative steps between the field and the lab and the field and the lab because this is the best way to actually understand what is happening on the physiological sense and what is happening on the ecological sense. All right. So We've been working recently for the past approximately maybe 10 years on calcareous sponges, and we have generated extensive body of knowledge. We have genomic resources. We have ever-growing uh, repertoire of molecular methods, and we found them to be suitable for many questions. And I'm not going to bore you with details, but we have gone through the entire life cycle of Sicon ciliatum, and now we are going through Sicon capricorn, and we've been looking at a variety of different processes, cell differentiation, axial patterning, regeneration, about which I was talking uh, last year here, and we've published a num number of papers using them as models for evolutionary and developmental biology studies. But what I would really like to talk to you now until uh, my time is over and Ryan kicks me out of here is about using calci sponges or calcareous calcifying sponges as systems, as model systems to study microbiomes. So we have a number of questions that we continuously discuss uh, in the lab. So what is the composition of calcareous sponge microbiome? What is the mode of transition? Uh, what is the function? Where is there is any stability uh, that is associated with the microbiome or is it very changing depending on the environment? And importantly, what is the role of resi or in resilience of the microbiome? So, <coughs> I'm going to take a step back and I'm going to tell you that one of the methods we are using is digging in the huge number of genomes we have generated through the years and we are trying to identify microbial components of those genomes because we are really sequencing metagenomes and not genomes as I have found. So I was originally saying that we are sequencing sponge genomes and then there are all those contaminations but I have responded to this paradigm shift in the field and I'm saying we've been sequencing metagenomes all the time. So we wondered if we can identify microbes that are present both in the larvae and adults. If we have the same microbes in larvae and adults, we would say that there is likely to be a vertical transmission. And then we were interested in coevolution of the microbes and the hosts. So we were interested in finding out whether we would be able to identify microbes that are closer related in, uh, in related species that are living in very different habitats than in very different species that are living together. Because the idea is that there is vertical transfer, there is coevolution, we would see phylogenetic signal in the symbiosis. So we would be talking about philosymbiosis. So we've been digging through those metagenomes, and as I said, uh, we've been accumulating a number of genomic data sets uh, throughout the years. We have samples from Norway, we have samples from Queensland, we have samples from New South Wales. I would like you to focus on this area of the tree. So in Norway, we have a Clatrina species, Clatrina lacunosa, which lives close to Leucosolenia and Sycon, which are Calcaronians. We have Periharax that is relatively related to it that is in Queensland. And we have additional species. For Clatrina, we have Coriacea and Laminoclatrata, Norway and Western Australia. And for Sycon, we have Capricorn, which we collect in New South Wales, but it's been described uh, in Queensland. And we have some other probably unknown species. For some of them, Halisarca, which is our control demo sponge here, and the Clatrina lacunosa, and also for Siconciliatum, we also have data set derived from sequencing of pure larvae. And when I say pure larvae, I mean these are larvae that I have manually picked up. In case of Siconciliatum, this was 10,000 tiny larvae, and I can assure you there were no uh, serious contaminations there. But of course, the microbiome component was carried over. So what did we do next? We have, we have somehow simplified the analysis by looking only for 16S and 18S ribosomal RNA sequences. You don't need to know what they are doing. The important thing is that every organism, almost every organism, at least every organism I know about, has 16S or 18S <coughs> RNA, and these sequences are very similar to each other, and they carry signal that can tell you what species this is, or at least what genus this is, and uh, people have been using this as a standard metabarcoding uh, method to identify variety of, of species in their populations. 
So what we have done, or when I say we, in this case, I mean Martin, uh, Martin has constructed this beautiful tree that contains 1,141 sequences. 511 of these are derived from sponges from our data sets. Uh, some are not complete, and they are only limited to those that are commonly present in our libraries. So, the, so there has to be more than 10 counts per library. And there is also 630 sequences from a very Toro um, 16S RNA database, which is called SILVA, which allows us to anchor those sequences and allows us also to find out what the sequences we are finding are closest related to. And when Martin built this tree, he told me, well, good luck looking at 1,141 sequences. How are you going to make sense of it? And I said, well, it's going to be really simple because I'm going to be looking for clades where I'll be finding bacteria present in larvae and adults, and then there would be more closely, more similar in closely related species. Surprise, surprise, I found two branches like that. One is a bit confusing, the other one is this one. So you can see Sicon Capricorn from Jervis Bay, Purple is here, together with Sicon Ciliatum from Sicon Bay, Norway. We have named it. I don't think it's on any of the map, but we, we found those cycles there, so we call it Sicon Bay. And then Leucosolenia complicata, which lives together with Sicon Ciliatum, is separate from the Sicon Capricorn and Sicon Ciliatum clade. So I was very excited because this is suggesting that there is vertical transfer, there is some kind of coevolution, but what are those? So it turns out that this is endozoicomonas, and endozoicomonas, turns out, is are symbiotic bacteria that are known to be symbionts of a lot of animals, including corals and ascidians and so on. We don't know what they do, and we don't know what is the mode of transmission. So to figure out if the mode of transmission could be really vertical, as suggested by the sequence data, we have done fish or fluorescent in situ hybridization, which allows us to detect bacteria in the tissues. So this is, um, I think, rather pleasing picture that is showing you a section of Sicon uh, ciliatum. It's a pre-inversion stage. So this is an embryo like that. You have macromers here, and you have micromers here, and all the green dots are bacteria. So what I would like you to, to notice is that there are bacteria on the outside, in the pinacocytes, on the surface of the sponge, but there are also bacteria inside of the embryo that have passed there uh, through the mother. And what is more, if we are looking at Sicon Capricorn in a slightly later post-inversion stage, we are also seeing all those bacteria entering the embryo, so they are really transferred by the mother. What is more, we have also done, and when I say we, in this case it means Oli, done a double fish in which we were looking at finding if endozoicomonas probe co-localizes with all the bacteria probe, and it turns out that indeed, if you look among those macromers, you are going to find single large cells, single large bacterial cells that are suggesting they are endozoicomonas. So endozoicomonas appears to be vertically transmitted. All right, so where do we go from there? We know now that the composition of microbiomes is very complex. We want that the mode of transmission is likely a combination of vertical, I'm very convinced about it, but there's also an environmental component. And we are going to do a lot of cool stuff, and if you want to see, to hear about how cool stuff we are going to be doing, you should be talking to Oli. Uh, we don't know about the function, but we have a suspicion that there is carbohydrate cycling that is, in, that is involving endozoicomonas and regulation of growth, population of other bacteria, done by Vibrio, which you also find there. We don't know anything about the stability, but we have an experimental setup that is ready to be used. It's very high tech, as you can see, but it works. Uh, and the role in the resilience, well, we don't know. But because we are identifying that there is the vertical transfer, uh, I have a suspicion that it will not be easy to environmentally swap symbionts, which means if we change the environment and there is loss of symbionts, there might be a big problem, which means we should be really taking a very good care of the reef. And with that, I just wanted to end with this long list of people who have contributed in a variety of ways, and I hear Ryan is getting upset. Thank you very much. Thank you.